good morning, good afternoon, and it's wonderful to be here. And I just wanted to start by saying, firstly, hello to everyone. But secondly, thank you, uh, uh, Zelma, to the team uh, for their support uh, ahead of this. So I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes, uh, and then I very much look forward to the conversation uh, with you, Zelma, and with uh, questions from the audience. So let me just kick off and say, um, I'm going to talk about the next 10 years, and I'm going to describe them as the exponential decade, and I'll explain why we think that's the case, and there will be good exponentials, and there will be bad exponentials. And in terms of the positive uh, exponential trends, uh, I'll be talking about uh, green swans, uh, but more of that in a moment. And when I've been calling, and I'm sure that's true uh, of many of people in the audience today, people in California and places like that recently. This is the sort of picture I've been getting on uh, Skype or Zoom or the, the different platforms through their bedroom windows of a world on fire. And not that long ago, that was also true of Australia. We live in extraordinary uh, times. So um, let me just then move on and say um, those extraordinary times are not going to end anytime soon. This diagram, uh, relatively simple actually, it, it shows the trajectory, the trend that we're on uh, as a species at the moment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the sort of changes that we would need to make in order to get to 1.5 degrees uh, or anything like uh, that. And I don't know how many of you read science fiction. I, I did in the 1960s and 1970s. I've started to do more of it recently or read more of it recently, particularly Chinese science fiction, because it's suddenly become very much more interesting because so much is changing uh, in the world now. And the, uh, the novel shown on the uh, right, American War, is one of the most interesting and frightening that I've yet uh, read and it describes a, a, a United States which goes into civil war, not this time because of slavery, but because of fossil fuels. Now that once would have seemed extraordinary, unimaginable, but unfortunately it's becoming uh, more imaginable almost by uh, the day. But first a few words, um, uh, uh, Zelma's already uh, described who I am. Let me just say a few quick things about what brought me to the thinking and ideas that I'm about to share. I'm a baby boomer, so I'm, I'm 71. I've been over 45 years professionally in the environmental and sustainability field. Uh, I've founded or co-founded uh, four what we would now call social businesses since 1978. And they all still exist, which is quite an achievement for the people who've worked with me. Um, I've served on over 70 boards or uh, advisory boards and over time have done quite a number of books. And this is the most recent one, it's the 20th. Um, and this is Green Swans and the title, the subtitle is The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism. And I'll explain that uh, in a moment, what that uh, means. But just to make a very simple point, um, the book talks about a number of black swans, which is a concept that uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb originally came up with, and I'll talk briefly about him uh, as well. And the book has quite a number of these black swan problems. So, for example, plastics in the ocean, uh, the pandemic of obesity or overweightness um, spreading around the world, and chronic diseases and diabetes associated with that. So, Mexico is a uh, probably the worst country in the world for that now. Uh, and then uh, the climate emergency and behind that uh, the uh, biodiversity uh, emergency. So I got quite um, uh, anxious or um, uh, unsettled a couple of years ago and I recalled one of the ideas for which I'm perhaps um, quite well known which is the triple bottom line which I um, launched in 1994 and for the first time ever according to the harvard business review i recalled a management concept that had never been done before uh, i did it um, in 2018 through the harvard business review and the cartoon on the left 
shows the original idea, or at least some of the original thinking uh, behind the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. So the fish obviously representing the natural world, uh, the woman representing the poor, the dispossessed around the world, and then the robot uh, representing the deep future, long-term thinking. And when I got the Financial Times um, cartoonist, Ingram Pinn, to draw that for me, um, the robot was a bit of a joke. I mean, who would ever imagine a robot at a board uh, table? Well, in 2014 in Hong Kong, uh, the first expert system uh, was appointed to a board. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that uh, over time. So I, I don't think robotics and artificial intelligence will save us, but I think they will have a, a big role to play in managing our planet and managing our complex challenges. Now, in all of this, I don't mean to say that the triple bottom line is dead. What I mean to say is it's not being properly understood or properly uh, applied or used. I love the B Corporation movement. In fact, both the uh, uh, two most recent uh, businesses that I founded, Sustainability from 1987 and Volance uh, from 2008, uh, are B Corporations. So I, 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 I'm not saying uh, those sorts of organizations or sustainability reporting are not uh, important. They really are. Uh, but there's something much more fundamental going on at the moment. And this was the Financial Times, sort of business paper in, in, uh, uh, published in uh, London, but a couple of years back. Uh, and, and this was a great big yellow cover wrapped around the newspaper. Who would have thought, this sounds almost like Greenpeace, sort of 15 or 20 years ago, uh, basically the message being that capitalism has major structural problems and those now need to be addressed. And in a way, one of the champions of the style of capitalism, which we have got used to in the last 50 years, was Milton Friedman, um, a very brilliant man. Uh, but some of his ideas have actually, unfortunately, um, uh, affected us in ways I don't think he ever imagined that they might. And just a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times published a full page advertisement shown on the left um, from a group of hundreds of organizations um, called Imperative 21. I, I won't go through all of the issues on the right, but what they were saying was Milton Friedman 50 years ago through the New York Times published his manifesto on profitability being this almost the sole uh, purpose of companies. Um, and what we're now seeing is a much wider uh, social, ethical, environmental political, in a way, uh, agenda emerging, very often boiled down to ESG, so uh, environment, social and governance. But this is a way this is a way that I find it quite helpful to think about this. This was done by the Future Fit uh, Foundation. And what it shows is three stages in the evolution of this agenda. First one, a world in which uh, business and environment and society were really not linked, uh, in, at least in business minds. Uh, very much at all. And then we had the period of the triple bottom line, the double bottom line, shared value and so on. Uh, and the, these areas started to overlap uh, a bit and then increasingly. But on the right, I think uh, in terms of system value rather than shared value, I think we see, begin to see the nature and scale in a way of tomorrow's uh, business agenda. So business is still very much central to things, but it is within uh, a much broader uh, set of rings of society uh, and environment. And I find that very helpful when I'm trying to think about what we're talking about here. So obvious question, has the pandemic uh, killed this whole agenda dead? Uh, well, it certainly set it back and the Gates Foundation um, uh, about five or six weeks ago uh, published um, uh, a statement saying uh, COVID-19 had set back the development agenda by 25 years in 25 weeks. Uh, and I think that's not only true, but probably in different parts of the world, we're going to see that negative impact becoming even more serious. On the upside, uh, on the positive side, uh, I mentioned uh, environment, social and governance investment, and you'll be hearing more about that later on today. Um, that ESG agenda has really started to gain traction 
um, both in Europe and in, in the United States. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is not only is the performance of ESG funds uh, on balance better than the non-ESG ones, but in each of those areas of E, S and G, you're getting an expansion of the agenda. So under the social heading, you've got things like wealth divides, you've got things like uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, and in each of these areas, you're getting an, an expansion of the range of uh, priorities and concerns. And that will continue to expand as people do stupid things, as people do. Uh, so in Australia recently, we had Rio Tinto blow up uh, Aboriginal caves that were 46,000 years uh, in use by humans. I mean, how stupid really can uh, we get? But on the other hand, there are some extraordinary announcements being made by uh, major companies at the moment. One of them about three weeks ago now uh, was Walmart. So the, wall, the world's largest retailer uh, committing itself, this was their CEO, committing Walmart to becoming a regenerative company. So not just responsible, uh, regenerative. And I'll come on in a moment to explain what I think that means. But uh, this is where I think we are. Uh, and the time scale, this, it, this time scale of this diagram is decayed. So we've all grown up in a world which uh, more or less came out of the Second World War, the Bretton Woods uh, agreements, the Marshall Plan, and so on. And a style of capitalism and of regulation of capitalism was established then, which has more or less uh, continued, except that that regulation has gradually been weakened. So people are now thinking, will there be a U-shaped, a V-shaped, a W-shaped, a K-shaped uh, recovery? Well, we'll see bits and pieces of that, but I think underneath it, there's a 10 to 15 year period where that old order starts to weaken and then collapse. And to some degree, a new order comes through. This always happens. This is this is something that we've seen in different uh, times in history. And in the bottom, that sort of red zone, that's what we see in some parts of the world, including in my own country, the United Kingdom, where people become confused, they become fearful, and increasingly they become anxious uh, as well. And what, what COVID-19 has done is accelerate all of that. It, it, it's taken trends that already happened happening and, and give them given them a very big boost. Now, I said right at the beginning that I thought this was going to be an exponential decade. In a way, COVID-19 has started that off uh, with a bang, in a way. Young people are beginning to feel uh, that something is profoundly wrong uh, with the world. The millennial generation uh, around the world is just a big survey uh, that's been published showing that younger people are now losing faith in democracy and in capitalism. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. And yet, I think uh, Greta Thunberg and, and, and some of these emerging leaders are uh, showing us a way forward. And I, I, you know, I, I hold her in high uh, regard. So exp exponential decay. Many businesses are looking at the Sustainable Development Goals and thinking or seeing them or thinking of them as incremental goals. They're not. They're, they're about system change. And if you just take the first two global goals, no poverty and zero hunger, both by 2030, those are super exponential goals. Uh, even if you took them out to 2050 or 2060, they would still be exponential. But is business, are investors thinking about uh, this in that way? I don't think so. I don't think they are as yet. I think they, uh, they're going to have to. Uh, and the problem with all of that is that our brains aren't very good at thinking exponentially. And the thing about exponential trends is they, for a long time, nothing very much seems uh, to happen. And then there's an inflection point. There's a moment where uh, a breakthrough happens. And I think we're very, very close to that in a positive way, not just in uh, negative ways. So the swans have been mentioned. And I just wanted to say a little bit more about black swans and green. Uh, so Nassim Nicholas Taleb, shown here, uh, produced his book, uh, The Black Swan, in 2007, just ahead of the 2007-2009 uh, financial crash. So, I mean, he basically called that one at a time when many other people couldn't see it uh, coming. The point he made at the time was that black swans 
are a complete surprise. Uh, they have an extreme impact. Uh, and then afterwards, we look back at what's just happened to us. We think we've understood what happened. And very often we haven't really uh, understood at all. So we set ourselves up uh, to fail uh, again. So he's been asked any number of times now whether COVID-19 is a black swan. And he says, no, it isn't, because we saw it coming. Um, uh, government set up agencies to deal with pandemics. The United States shut theirs down, uh, the, the, the White House uh, unit. Um, in the UK, we had a what was called Project Cygnus, uh, looking at the risk of pandemics. It pretty much predicted what was going to happen. The government ignored it. Um, so uh, black swans are going to be with us uh, for as long as we live on this planet. But I'm now going to lean into the future of uh, green swans. Now, I'm not going to read all of this text, simply to say that green swans, at least in our minds, are not individuals. They're not companies. Uh, although you can have individuals and companies that play into green swan uh, trajectories, they're profound market shifts and shifts in other elements of what make up uh, markets. And if I'm asked to give an example, you know, my own country is coming out of the European Union, and I very much regret that. Uh, but in the EU, uh, they now have a green deal, uh, which is aiming towards uh, inclusive and green uh, recoveries uh, across the uh, Union, uh, and that's something like 1.82 trillion uh, euros. So it's a huge sum of money. We'll see how that goes. But that, for me, is an example of the sort of scale of ambition that we now uh, need. Luckily, technology or many forms of technology, particularly digital ones, are going very much in the right direction. So this is a, a slide many of you will have seen similar uh, slides um, showing the uh, uh, predicted decline in the cost of solar energy uh, through to 2050, to the point where not only does it become radically cheaper than fossil fuel uh, uh, electricity generation, but it almost gets to the point of being virtually free. So what does that do uh, to the future? I think it's actually very exciting, but it, while we're getting excited, we also need to remember that any breakthrough technology comes with unintended consequences. So this obviously is a, a windmill rotor or vane. Um, what we're now finding when some of the uh, older windmills are coming to the end of their useful life is we don't know what to do with the, these rotors or vanes. We, we, we can't think of how we're going to uh, recycle them. So we should have perhaps thought of that earlier on. So a few final slides, and this is about where we're headed, where the future might take us. And the first is, it's, I find it fascinating that the language of impact is now coming up around the world. The, the, this is the front cover of a book by uh, uh, Sir Ronald Cohen, a uh, very well-known um, investor in, in, in Europe. And I think uh, whether negative or positive impact, business and governments and all of us are going to have to speak uh, the language of impact much more fluently than we currently do. Uh, and in recent months, one of the companies we've worked with in the Spanish speaking world is um, Acciona, the infrastructure and um, renewable energy company uh, based in uh, Madrid. And we've taken uh, almost 30 of their younger leaders and we've brought them into a, an internal discussion around what would it mean to be not only a responsible company, but one that promotes resilience in the infrastructures that it uh, builds and regenerates across the economic, social and environmental dimensions. It's been one of the most exciting projects I've ever been uh, involved in. And in terms of the, the future, um, there are going to be good things and there are going to be, for some people, some really, really tough uh, moments. I think uh, when people wake up within the next few years, as they're beginning to do, to the costs of burning carbon uh, in terms of uh, climate change and so on, uh, and air quality and health issues. There's going to be a, a mad scramble. I mean, we're a herd animal. This is what we do. Everyone's going to try and get out of carbon in very short order. So this is a boom and bust uh, future. And I don't like it, but I think that's probably where we're headed. And you have two people in this photograph, Rex Tillerson, the former uh, chairman and CEO of Exxon Mobil on the left, and a very recognizable uh, government uh, head uh, as uh, 
third from the uh, right. But what was fascinating, again, just very, very few weeks ago, was to see ExxonMobil, used to be a giant, the biggest company in the world, uh, losing in, in, in the last 18 months or so, something like two thirds of its value and being overtaken uh, for the first time ever by a renewable energy company uh, in terms of valuation, uh, next era uh, energy. So a couple of final slides. Um, this one on the right, we have a set, set of trend lines uh, and you'll see they go responsibility, resilience, regeneration. And I think what the, the, the sort of the, the violet or purple line is the world we've grown up in and the agenda and, and, and all of the points on these trend lines were put there by companies and one regulatory agency that we've worked with recently. So these aren't our ideas, that these are people who are deeply immersed in this field. So we're, we're, we're coming out of a period where responsibility has been enough and that's been leadership. And we're moving into a period, a transitional period, where we move from one economic order to another uh, and the shock waves from that will be, as I've said, uh, very considerable indeed. So the political challenge is going to be enormous. But the point about resilience is you can't just wish it into being. You can't talk about resilience and have it happen. You've got to invest in the systems that resilience uh, comes from. So, for example, your economies, your societies and communities, the natural environment, all of them have got to be invested in uh, in new ways. And that may seem an extraordinary thing to say right in the middle of COVID-19, where we're throwing money at uh, the pandemic. But the interesting thing about the EU Green Deal is that it's trying to pull all of those elements uh, together. So I think it, we do see a future of potential uh, green swans. Uh, and one of the things that we've just done is to set up a um, green swans observatory to identify uh, different examples in different sectors, different geographies against different issues. Um, and one of the things that at the same time we're looking for is ugly ducklings, initiatives, technologies, business models, policies that might over time grow into tomorrow's uh, green uh, swans. And just on the screen here are some of the really interesting uh, Peruvian uh, companies that I've come across uh, recently. And um, I, I think your country has got some very interesting examples of ugly ducklings, and we very much look forward to finding out uh, more about them. So that's it uh, from me. Muchas gracias. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. What, what an inspiring uh, presentation. And um, I have a ton of questions here. <laughs> I'm going to start with the easy one. Since we have been talking about how companies can incorporate the sustainable development goals, I would like you to tell us why it might be a good idea to incorporate the, the goals into yeah. the narrative and the metrics. What do you think about that? Or is that something that we need to recall as well? No, I'm hoping I don't you're going to say no. <laughs> Well, I, I don't think we have to recall the uh, the, the global goals. Uh, in fact, I had um, uh, a conversation earlier on today with the chairman of Acciona, who was quite actively involved uh, in the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. And his one of his questions was, you know, are the Sustainable Development Goals now becoming tired? And I don't think they are. I think they are an extraordinary contribution, uh, a huge open the result of a huge open source. Um, process of consultation and innovation and so on. I think the, the main problem is, almost like the concept of sustainability, that people think they understand what the global goals are and they think they're about incremental change and they also believe they can look at what they're already doing and map that onto the 17 goals. And as long as they hit two or three or five of those um, colourful boxes, that's sort of job done, they're, they're on course. And I suppose what we're saying is, don't believe that. Be very careful about uh, misleading uh, your colleagues and your investors and so on, because given what's coming at us, that's not going to be enough. So I love the goals, uh, but I think we need to think about them a bit differently. And probably we need to think about it, so what from the company's point of view might be yeah. desirable, but also what is desirable for the country or what's the, what's the real need. So maybe, you know, once we understand that there's this global goal, 
and then you have country goals, and then what, what is the part that you that you play, what is the role that you play in that, rather than I'm going to play the role that I choose just looking at my bottom line. No, you're, you're totally right, Selma, and I, I think the both in sustainability reporting and the corporate responses to the sustainable development goals, people have thought it was enough just to publish their results and take no responsibility for the bigger uh, picture. And I think it's up to governments and it's up to politicians to start to say the implication of the global goals are that this country should achieve these sorts of uh, goals and targets over time, maybe by the 2030s, uh, and that then uh, industry sectors and companies start to deliver against those. So that, that requires a level of um, engagement by government, which is, uh, you can see it happening in some countries, but in many countries it's not properly happening, happening as yet. So this is political, and I think the final point is that uh, for a very long time, business leaders have been told to stay out of politics because we don't trust them. Uh, we don't trust them to do the right thing. But actually, business leaders, their future markets uh, and the engagement with their key stakeholders, investors, customers, consumers, will depend on the successful delivery of the global goal. So you're, you're absolutely right. Governments have to set the context, but I think uh, corporate leaders have to step up individually and collectively to push for the market shifts that we actually uh, need to see. I, I love that you open the conversation around politics because it is true, normally people in the corporate sector were more worried about what it is that we need to do in terms of innovation, you know, client service and all of that, and we're not very keen in getting ourselves involved in politics because of, you know, everything that's that entails being in politics. What is your view? How can we start that conversation? How can we bring the corporates into that space of collaboration with the political side? Well, well the first thing to say, Zalma, is I really don't want businesses running the world and I don't want them um, running governments and the rest of it because they're not democratically elected and I still believe uh, in democracy and elections. Um, but I, I think that they have a lot of uh, advice, useful advice to offer. And if they're going to do that, then I think uh, two things are true. Firstly, um, they should be completely transparent about what, about what they're advising governments to do. Okay. Uh, and they should take you know, some degree of responsibility that if what they advise governments to do doesn't work. But also they, they should recognize that if you're going to do politics, you have to do it jointly. I mean, you can do it individually if you're a big enough company or a, a wealthy enough individual or whatever. But increasingly, I think we're going to need and we're beginning to see uh, business to business platforms like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, like the UN Global Compact and others, recognizing that this is um, something that governments should be doing. So Lisa Kingo, the, the former Global Compact head, was talking about companies needing to become activists. And I think that's absolutely right. Okay. So I, I have a few questions from, um, uh, we have a Peruvian chapter of Women Corporate Directors, WCD. Um, this is a group of women who actually sit at boards around the world and are pushing for governance and um, impact, social impact. Yeah. And we're debating here in the chat, which is, you know, sort of like, Asking this, asking that, uh, we're thinking, how do we get the conversation in the boardroom down? Because you talked about the fact that we should move from shareholder value to system value. Yeah. Now, this is something that CEOs are not going to do unless their board tells them to. And you have been in this business for you know some time. And I would like you to explore what, what have you seen? Has there been any change in the past 25 years? So that the, the conversations that you heard at the board level, how they have changed? And what do you think is the role of the board so we can go to system value um, proposal? 
Well, well, thank you for the question. And I love the sound of the network uh, that you're sort of part of. And um, last night I was part of a, um, a, a, a debate with Roger Martin. Um, some people will know him. He's been warning for a long time that efficiency, as we've globalized, has damaged resilience. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating uh, conversation. And right at the end, almost as a joke, I asked the question as to whether if you look at COVID-19 and which governments have actually responded uh, most successfully, they tend to be run by women. Angela Merkel, Jacinda uh, Ardern. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary. And I think we're seeing at a time now where the nature of the problems and challenges and opportunities that we now face need a different form of approach from boards. And very typically, boards have uh, got to the point where they are looking at tax issues and legal issues and compliance stuff and so on, and their capacity to think about disruptive changes in their markets and so on is not as great as it, 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 as it ought to be. So to your question, I've worked with boards for 35, 40 years. When I first started, it was almost impossible to get in. You considered yourself uh, you know, the, the, uh, as though you had some sort of miracle to get through the, the, the front <laughs> gate or the door. Uh, and people really, they only wanted you there because they wanted to see what this sort of problem was and to see somebody who was involved in it. Whereas now you've seen this huge generational shift. So there are younger people coming up on boards. There's still many of them in their uh, 60s and 70s, but nonetheless, they're young, younger. And they, 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 they're actually listening, some of them, to... Uh, a very different set of younger people. And they now know this is their future. They now know this agenda is becoming mainstream. What they don't know always is how do they then deal uh, with it? And back to your point about um, many boards won't do this, whether it's um, uh, investing in regeneration or system change or whatever. Well, that's where governments come in again. They've got to incentivize. Uh, uh, they've got to skew markets towards the right sort of uh, behavior and that's easier in some countries than it is uh, in others. So basically what you're telling me is that maybe we still need to push to change the mindset um, at the board level but we can also leverage with policy makers to help the market get to this regenerative economy. I, I do. And I think, again, one of the things that's really astonishing, you know, when I started, you very, very rarely heard CEOs or business leaders talking about big environmental, social or governance issues. They just didn't do it because it wasn't almost polite in, in, in their circles to mention those sorts of uh, things. I was I did a conference this morning in Portugal and two CEOs uh, were on the on the um uh, stage and uh, uh, part of the same panel and one of them was talking about plastics in the ocean and his personal experience of that and the other one who runs a very big uh, wine and olive oil company there was saying the climate change uh, challenge is getting bigger by the month uh, for them they can actually see it in their productivity and uh, you know the meteorological uh, record so um, I think it is changing I think people still they're, they're, even leaders are herd animals. They want to see a number of others moving in the same direction. And, and um, the book, Green Swans, has a wonderful uh, foreword from Paul Polman, who many people will know used to be the CEO uh, of Unilever. Um, and the, the thing I'm going to say about him is that he has been chairman of the Global Compact, of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, of the World Economic Forum. But but a lot of those are hundreds or thousands of companies. He's now chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce with something like 44 million companies around the world. Oh. And I don't believe one person can change uh, anything uh, at the system level. But the very fact that he's gradually been invited into bigger and bigger uh, business to business organizations, I think is quite encouraging. Absolutely. And I think probably one of the challenges is um, how do we change the incentives for CEOs yeah. and the quarterly reporting that we have? And because, you know, at the end of the day, they, they have a lot of pressure. Michaela is here saying <laughs> yes, yes. And um, there is a lot of pressure in that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the ugly ducklings and the yeah. green swans. And um, I have some questions 
and the questions are why is ugly ducklings why and um, can we explore how can we spot ugly ducklings how can we nurture them and how can be how can we remain so close that we are able to push them into green swans yeah no it, 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 it's a fantastic question and thank you uh, for it um when i started uh, I was mainly thinking about green swans, but then I thought about where do these, where do the the uh, organisations and initiatives drive the drive these market trends come from? And again, to your question, how do you spot them early enough to really make um, a, a, a difference? And actually, before the book came out last year, I did a big event in Copenhagen, and I launched the idea of the green duckling. There, because sorry, the ugly duckling, uh, because of Hans Christian Andersen. And one of the, one of the things I found is, if I'm working in Japan, for example, they know the story of the ugly duckling. So the idea is something that looks very peculiar, looks weird. We don't recognise it for what it is, but it has the potential to become uh, something very different. Then to your question about how do we sort of identify and support them, that's part of the reason that we set up the observatory. And I had a session, I think, just yesterday with the World Bank, and they are, are re they they got really quite excited about the idea of putting some of their uh, uh, ugly duckling spotters um, to work on this. They got a, next week is a, is an entire week uh, for the World Bank with hundreds of their top people involved, um, and they're going to ask them to look for ugly ducklings and uh, green swans. So it's a game at one level. But at the same time, it's a game that sometimes I believe in playfulness uh, in the sense that if you if you just dump complexity in people's laps, whether in the boardroom or wherever, community leaders or whatever, they're just they, they're not going to know what to do with it. Whereas if you play a game, you can sort of uh, engage them and, and get them uh, thinking. So we're already finding we've got universities, we've got business schools, we've got technology net networks starting to contribute uh, their nominations. Uh, for ugly ducklings. We're, we're still working on the principles for finally selecting the ones that we think will fly. Um, but uh, if anyone's interested, we'd be very happy to share uh, the principles and, and, uh, and details of what we're doing. And we'd oh, love absolutely. to have nomination. Yes, ab absolutely. I already have some, some requests here. Fantastic. To, to contact you and to understand. I mean, the bottom line is, if you want to be a green swan, you have to be an ugly duckling probably first. And um, ugly duckling is actually a very good thing to be. It is. And we partly picked it because ugly doesn't, it's not something that people aspire to be. And yet, in this particular form, I think it is something to aspire to uh, be. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so true. You know, so many people and so many businesses start with a crazy idea that that seems far out to many people, even you know people within the company. But it's because you know most people are trying to solve future problems with the same mindset, or, or, or future possibilities with the same mindset that actually created the problems. Which is something we're going to be talking about with Otto Sharmer tomorrow, whom you actually um, refer to in in your book. And yeah. um, so it's it's going to be great to have the match between what we've talked today and. And tomorrow, I have a couple of questions to to close because I know you have a super yeah. busy agenda. Um, one has to do with in, in your book you talk about digital tech and algorithms, and in this new exponential era that we're going to yeah. be that we are already living. What are your thoughts on what is the role that we have to play? I mean, I, I obviously tech is not going to solve the problems for us. I think many people are perhaps too invested in, in thinking that artificial intelligence and data and technology is going to solve a lot of problems. What, what is your thoughts on that? Well, firstly, do say hello for me to Otto Sharma. I only met him uh, this year virtually through uh, a, a session like this, but I love his work. So I, I, I will see if I can sort of get involved in that session. But in terms of technology, we absolutely need technology to help us drive all of this forward. But we all know that every time new technologies come through, and they could be big data-based expert systems, AI, algorithms or whatever, 
firstly, people don't know what's happening all around them, so they find it very difficult to challenge or, or criticize. Uh, but secondly, um, the the as we're seeing with Facebook and as we're seeing with some of these giant IT companies that are getting into surveillance, are getting into facial recognition, getting into all sorts of things which which affect people's daily lives where their, their sort of credit worthiness starts to be influenced by algorithms which they know nothing uh, about and information or data that's been scooped uh, from the internet in a way that they just don't even begin to understand. And that's why I don't think that we will ever stop needing campaigners and activists and, and, and non-governmental organizations. I think they're essential but I, I, what I'm saying to business leaders is don't leave it to the NGOs. You too have got to be activists on, on, on some of these things. And for people like Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, I think he's actually being uh, stupid at the moment. I think he's denying an inevitable future. Well, with the greatest of respect, uh, but I, I, I really think he is. Um, uh, because he he should have studied history. But the problem is most of these uh, tech giants uh, dropped out of uh, university didn't take in, into on board much of the, uh, the the history that they should have been taking because history shows that every time you do what uh, these giant companies are doing, government has to wade in and break them up, and that's going to happen. And you already see uh, uh, Google under pressure. The other ones will come under pressure uh, pretty soon. So I, I believe in technology's potential to make a huge difference in our world, but again, regulation and government action uh, remains incredibly important to make sure that the long-term uh, trend is the right one, rather than us constantly going off in the wrong direction and having to haul ourselves back, which is messy and wasteful um, and painful at times. Wonderful. I love what you said. I'm, I'm a big uh, believer that I think we should all invest more time in reading about history, economics, and philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think it builds substance and character, and it helps you see the world in a better in a better lens. Um, I have one last question for you, mm -hmm. and the question is: What advice would you have for the corporate sector, the leadership corporate sector in Peru, um, so we can? perhaps have this broader thinking as to the development. I mean, no one is going to come and help us out, right? We're not going to wait for the US or Europe to come and say, okay, Peru, I'm going to help you out. So what is the right mindset that we need to have? What is it that we need to do? What, are, what is the boldness that we, we have to show? It's a fascinating question. I think the first thing I would say is that uh, don't imagine that this is going to be all pain and doom. Actually, it's great fun. And one of the reasons I've stayed in this field is it's endlessly interesting. And I've seen um, all sorts of businesses make a considerable uh, success of it. So um, this, I think, is the future. And very often, the future starts to evolve on the edge of the current system. So Peru may seem a long way from uh, some parts of the world, but there's absolutely no reason at all uh, why small and even family-owned businesses and so on in a country like Peru cannot get involved and shape this uh, agenda. And one of the things I think is very striking is that companies that have adopted this change agenda are very often, they're not particularly wanting to force it on other companies in their supply chains, but they're, they're interested in seeing what they can do to enable uh, the right sort of action. So don't just sort of hide the fact that you're not doing terribly well from your big international uh, customers. Share your, your ch challenges with them and ask them for support. And it, I, you know, sometimes that might backfire, but in general, I think that's absolutely the way to go. I think the next 10 to 15 years, I, I've said it before, but you know, I'm 71, I could be retiring. I think this is the most exciting, challenging, uh, and to some degree politically dangerous period of my entire uh, life. I'm really looking forward to being involved, and I hope uh, many of your uh, audience and many of your members and so on will actually be uh, at the, at really invest time and effort because we have to do it. Uh, let's make sure that we do it successfully and have fun as we go along. But Zelma, thank you very much for this conversation. No, thank you, John, so much. You're super inspiring. I am sure 
in fact, I'm certain that you're not going to retire anytime soon. <laughs> and we will be having more conversations about this. And uh, I look forward to reading your next book, which I know you're currently um, drafting. I wish the best to you and thank you so much. Um, and thank now you, we're going to... Thank you, Aldo. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank everyone you. involved. Thank, thank you. you so much.